Hello everyone. In this video series, I'm going to be showing you how to make this lovely little variable angle book stand made from nothing but material you can buy from your local DIY merchant. It will cost you very little to make. You can do it with very limited tools and you can pretty much do it in a weekend. So in this first episode, we're going to focus on marking out all of the joinery ready to be cut in the future episodes. So let's go. Right, so here is the timber that we're starting with. So I've got two lengths of it, which are two meters long and 12 by 32 millimeters in thickness and width, which is half an inch by one and a quarter inches for those of you still in the Stone Age. So in this episode, we're basically gonna get it all cut up into the lengths we need, um, planes down to size and then marked out, ready to be cut in the future episodes. So. Let's get in close. Right, so when you're buying this timber, firstly, make sure it actually looks nice. Like this bit here, I made sure, well, in fact, both of these bits, I made sure that the grain was nice and straight. It's quite tight as well, which is always good. That's gonna affect the overall look of the finished piece, obviously. But functional wise, make sure that you have a minimal amount of defects in it. And if there is a defect, make sure you can easily cut it out. What you don't want is a big bit of sap running up the edge of the timber, for example. Make sure you avoid those boards and also make sure it's actually relatively straight as well. So this bit has a big old kink around this knot where it's sort of bending over it. But as soon as I cut that out, this is going to sit flat on the desk. I know that this one here doesn't really have a lot of defects on it. But if I sight down it from end to end, it's pretty straight as well. So that's all fine. But yeah, just take your time when picking the timber. So um, what we're going to do now is get these components marked out. So we need two long components at 450 and three short components at 280. So starting at the ends of one of these lengths of timber, let's just get rid of that one. We are going to measure 450 and then some because we're going to plane it down on a shooting board afterwards and make the ends nice and square. So 450, let's make it, oh, I don't know, four, five, two maybe and then we'll mark another two millimeters, three millimeters along from that. And then those two lines is where our saw kerf is gonna be. So square those across and then do 450 from the second line. Okay, so when I do this, I can see that 450 is gonna include this knot here, which I don't want. So I'm going to make this one of my 280 components. So 280, let's make it 282 so I can plane it down. So then I can cut out that. And then all of this is wastage, which is good. Start a new one. So this can be the 450 component, I suppose. So 452, 455, and then a couple more at 280. So 280, and finally 282. Square that across, and then all of this stuff to my right and your left is wastage. So let's cut this to size now. Right, so I've got myself a shooting board here, which I'm also using as a bench hook. And this means that I can butt the timber against it and when I saw, it's gonna hold it all in place. So you can see I've got my two lines here and I'm gonna saw right between them. So I'm gonna nibble away at the back edge to start with and then I can follow that line along the width of the timber. Get a full cut. There you go, component one. Right, and there we go. So um, that bit can go down there. And there is all five of our components ready to be planed down to their final size. And we're going to do that back on the shooting board. So a shooting board is good because you can put the timber on its side like that, put the plane on its side, and then plane through. And because we've got this back support on here, it stops all of this timber from breaking out on the back. A shooting board is easier to make if you have a table saw and all those lovely machines that allow you to get a square cut. But if you don't have access to all that equipment, you can watch my video on how to make a very um, rudimentary shooting board, should we say, and the link for that is up in the top right corner. But first, I'm gonna get one of these long components and put it on here and just get one of these ends nice and square. Okay, and with that done, just gonna flip it over, make sure that sticker isn't on there, get rid of that. So flip it over, the same face is butted up against the fence either way, so then I can guarantee that both of these ends are going to be square to each other. So now do the other end and just clean that up. Okay, and then let's just measure that and see where we're at. So we're at about four, five, one at the moment. Um, you could leave it like that and just cut the other components that size, but I might as well plane it down just because. 
Right, there we go, that component is now at 450 exactly. So what we're gonna do is exactly the same on the other components. So get one end nice and square. Okay, that's looking good. And then flip it over on the same axis and then do the other side. But instead of measuring this for 450, what we're gonna do is simply place it on top of the other component and see if both of those ends are perfectly flush or not. Because if you measure it from a ruler, you might get small discrepancies here and there, and then it's gonna make the frame slightly skewed. So best to measure off one component to the other here. Cool, right, so that is the 450 millimeter components all cut to size. So when I put them together, the ends are perfectly flush. And that is literally the case of taking one or two shavings off each component at a time, and just making sure they do sit at exactly the same length. Take the time to put in that effort because it's gonna save you a lot of effort later on. So we're gonna do exactly the same for the 280 components and um, for the 280 components, for the three components at 280 millimeters long. Right, so now all five of these components have been cut to exactly the same length. So if I feel them on the ends, there is no overhang whatsoever. So with the three components, do one of them and then use that as your template for the other two. Don't go and do that one and then check it and then get your second one on there. Because if there's any discrepancies between the first and second, that's also going to be carried across to the third. So use one as your template on both of them and you'll get them exactly the same size. So what we're gonna do now is work out the face sides and face edges of all of these components to work out what we want at the front and to work out the orientation of the grain and all those things. So let's get this kind of laid out how it's going to be. So then it'll be three like that. Now, firstly, I'm going to focus on these top and bottom components. Um, that face looks quite nice and clean. That one yeah, actually looks a little bit fluffy and there's a small dent on here, which I'm looking at as well. So I might as well make that the back and on this one as well. Yeah, again, I've got a dent down here. So if I make that the back and at the bottom, you're never going to see that. So let's make these the face sides and face edges. So face side and face edge and then face side and face edge. Now I'm doing this in pen so you can easily see it on the camera, but you definitely want to do this with a pencil because it's much easier to remove at the end. Now with these components here, let's see, I've got two with quite a wide grain pattern on them and this one's got quite a thin grain pattern on them. So I might as well make the two wider ones on the outside and the thinner grain in the middle just to make it symmetrical. Um, and on these outer components, it kind of tapers from thin to wide grain thin to wide grain. Because this is thinner in the middle, I'm going to have it so the thin grain is also on the inside, and on this one, the thin grain is going to be on the inside, but I prefer that face there. So those can be our face sides and edges. So face side, face edge, face side, face edge. And then this one in the middle, obviously there's no particular orientation that can be, so let's just make it the left-hand side because I'm left-handed. And there we go. That's the orientations done. Right, so we're happy with the layout of all of these now, so they're all in the orientation we want. And what we're gonna start doing now is marking out some of the joints and the locations where they're gonna be. Now, on these top and bottom corners, or the corners of the frame, we're gonna do a half lap dovetail joint, but kind of tweak it a little bit, so it's only dovetailed on one side. And then in this middle one, we're gonna do a full on dovetail lap joint. So if you haven't seen my video on how to cut a dovetail lap joint, you can watch that in the top corner now, because that'll be pretty helpful, but I'm gonna kind of skim over it in this anyway. So basically, this project is a mixture between the practice joint frame and and the dovetail halving joint video, but in a project form, which is pretty good. So what we're gonna do here is flip the top and bottom components over. We don't need any of those. And then from one end, we're gonna mark 80 millimeters and put a small knife mark. And then on the opposite end, we're gonna mark 80 millimeters and put a small knife mark. So once again, I'm working on the back here because this is where the socket's going to be cut out. And then we're going to square from the, yep, from the face edge, which is on the back here, and knife that line all the way across. So nice and prominent like that, good. And on this one as well, from the same face edge, knife that across as well. Now, instead of marking 80 millimeters from the end on here, what we're gonna do is simply butt the components together, get them flush on one end, which you can do with a square, and then hold it all in place and do a little knife mark where the other knife line is and a little mark on this side as well. So that gets rid of any discrepancies that might happen. And then from the face edge, square that line across the top and bottom as well. So with those both marked out, that is where the outside components are gonna be nested. So they're gonna be on the inside of that joint. 
Um, and now we've got to work out the middle one. So these components are 450 millimeters long, which means the center of them is 225. So I'll put a little mark there for that. That is dead center. And then on these components, I'm gonna get my middle one here, measure the width on this, which is 32 millimeters, and then put a mark at 16, obviously. And then what I'm gonna do is just simply put that on the end here and line those two marks up. So now I know that this one is sitting dead center on the bottom component and put a tiny mark on either corner like that. And then put those components back together, get the ends flush and transfer those lines up. So now we can start marking out the dovetails on the shorter components. And one thing I forgot to do earlier was just number the components so it's a bit easier. So we'll do one, two, and three. Then I know what order they need to be in. Um, and I'll also do it on these top and bottom components as well. So face side out and face side out. And then let's make that A and let's make that one B. And there we go. Right, so I am going to keep, let's say B and component two here. And what we're going to do is get component B onto the end of two like this, so it's laying on top. And then with a square from our face edge, we're going to slide that up against the edge of number two and butt it up against B so that now that sits nice and square on this component. We're going to leave it about, I don't know, half a millimeter overhanging on the end here. So now component two is sitting proud of component B. And then we're going to take away component B and scratch a line across like that very carefully. And then we're going to get exactly the same on component A. So square from the face edge, slide it up to the end and then leave it so that component two is sitting proud of component A by about half a millimeter again, and then square that off. Right, and then I can get the shorter components again, and then I can mark them off component two. So get them flush on one end, just using the stock of the square, and then transfer those knife lines across. So transfer two onto three, and then square on the face edge, and square those across. And then we'll get rid of three, and we'll mark component two onto one. So get square on the end, and mark from the face edge. Uh, in the joint frame exercise that we did previously, the face side and face edge wasn't massively important because the timber was prepared perfectly square. Whereas, because I bought this timber from home base, I haven't properly measured it, but it is square enough. Um, but there is small discrepancies in it here and there. So if we keep to the face sides and face edges, it'll all be okay. But if you start mixing up by squaring it off from the opposite end and then go from that end, it's going to start throwing things out when you buy this budget timber like this. So really make sure you follow your marking out carefully with this. So now with all of these lines, I'm just going to get a square, reference it off the face side and square them around all of the edges. So there we go. Now all of those components are squared around the fronts and all of the edges. So now we can start marking out for the dovetails to the vise. Right, so at the moment I've got component two in the vise, which is the middle one, and that's gonna be the full-on dovetail. So getting a ruler on the end, I'm gonna measure in uh, maybe three millimeters from each side, square those lines along the top with a pen or pencil, then give myself a little mark on the face that I can set the sliding bevel up to, set that up to whatever dovetail angle you fancy. If you wanna know more about dovetail angles, I did a video on what dovetail ratios are best, so go and have a look at that. This one looks to be about one in eight, maybe, one in seven perhaps, I don't really know, but it's around that. Mark our waist and then we have a dovetail marked out. Right, and then on component one and three, you want to be careful here because we only want the dovetail slope on one side, and that side is going to be where the face edge is. So you can see my little swish here, face edge, that means the taper is going on this side, going towards the center of the frame. And what I could do here is measure in three millimeters and start the tail from there, but from above, that means that this one is going to be slightly wider than component two, which we did the dovetail on before. So what I'm gonna do instead is line up component two and get the edge of the dovetail on the edge of component one, just like that, and then put a little mark where that other line is and square that across. And then using the same dovetail, we're going to square that down to the baseline. And of course, Mark the waist so we don't cut the wrong side of that line. So we'll do exactly the same on all three remainder corners. So this one, the face edge is now on this side here. So that is going to be the side that we do our dovetail on. Draw a line. Right, so now all of the dovetails have been marked out on all six components, and we need to work out how far we want to nest these down into the other component. So we're gonna do that halfway, obviously. So these components are 12 millimeters thick which means I need to set my marking gauge to six millimeters. 
lock it down and then we're going to score a line around the end grain of all of these components and then along the long grain of the longer components here so we know how far to nest into each other and when we're using the marking gauge if you've watched my previous videos you know how important this is but you always want to be referencing the stock of the marking gauge from the face side like this so on this component i'm going to be going around the end grain stock pressed against the face side and scratch it all the way around the edge and sides there we go nice crisp line marked along there now and we're going to do the same on the bottom here so from the face side still Right, so that's those all marked out and scratched along the edge. So now we're going to be marking out the long grain on here. And again, make sure you're referencing from the face side. The reason we do this is so that the joint sits flush at the end of it, because if there's any discrepancies in the marking gauge, it's going to be doubled if you mark from the wrong sides. Hard to explain, but if you do it wrong, you'll see why you need to do it this way. So marking from the face side, I'm going to scratch between those two little dots that we put on the long component previously. Don't need to go any further than that. And then on the opposite side as well, from the face side, scratch between those dots as well. And then on these edge ones, I've got the inside boundary here, which we scratched on with the knife, but I might as well just give myself another little boundary to work from. So put the component up against that knife line and on the bottom as well. So I've got two little marks to go between there. And then marking from the face side still between those two marks. And we'll do that on the rest of the joints. Right, and there we go. That is all the marking out done. So these are ready to be nested together in the next episode. So we'll get it all joined up and everything. So if you haven't already, be sure to look at the kit I've put together on kit.com. It's a starter set that will allow you to do a project like this with minimal costs, but still get good quality tools out of it. And if you happen to buy any of those tools through the links in the description, I'll get a little cut of that. So that will help me out a little bit. And um, yeah, that's all I've got to say. See you in the next episode.